Today we've got a great story of revenge against a foul-smelling roommate. We'll get to that in a bit, but first, coke on a white shirt. Did this to a fellow correctional officer, captain, back in the day. Our office had a refrigerator used by all captains in our office. I worked days and would keep some plastic bottles of coke on hand. The captain on nights would always help himself to my coke. So when I got down to my last bottle, I heated up the end of a straightened paper clip and poked three evenly spaced holes into the bottle just down from the cap. I wish I was there to see it, but a coworker said he took a swig and dribbled coke down the front of his white shirt. I'm not gonna lie, going into this, when OP said coke on a white shirt and then mentioned correctional officer, I thought they were gonna go kind of in the powdery direction. Also, hi, I'm Steven, and if you enjoy awesome stories of revenge, why not hit that subscribe button down below? That said, our next story is, won't communicate properly? Okay then. So this happened around my last month in college. So I enrolled in nursing school, and from where I enrolled, we were fixed with a group where we would always be together during clinical rotations, etc. Short background, for us to graduate and take the local board exam, we needed to comply with the requirements of our regulatory board. This included handling and assisting during births and surgeries. When the pandemic happened, we couldn't finish our requirements, and we were stuck with online school for three semesters. So, on our last semester of the entire program, the school could finally conduct face-to-face -face classes that included our clinical rotations slash related learning experience in the hospital. Now, I'm the leader of my group. They appointed me the leader because of my experience as a student leader. So, I was the one who made a rotation for my group on who'd be handling the following case assisting during birth. Throughout our exposure in the delivery room, there were only three or four of us left who lacked the requirements. This included me and Gary, obviously not his real name, so I, alongside Anna, not her real name but also lacks one more delivery, had to make a new rotation so that we, the ones lacking, were the only ones to take new cases. Gary saw the new rotation, we were sitting afar, but he was in our vision, and was angry because why was he last on the rotation? So he threw the rotation and didn't talk to me for the rest of the day instead of communicating with me privately and what any other practicing professional would do. Gary always comes in late. Luckily on the last two days of our rotation, there were deliveries and I could handle them because I always arrive early. Deliveries are spontaneous, so there's no assurance when the next delivery will be. He was pissed and he'd always sulk. Cue the Betty Revenge. Gary always entrusts me with his things since we've become groupmates because he always loses his stuff, his logbook, his requirements for graduation, I help out my members and because of how organized I can be. So on the day he was pissed, I gave him back everything that was with me. In our last few weeks, our admin announced to compile all of our requirements. He was panicking because he couldn't find his requirements and was asking the rest of my groupmates if they'd seen them. Since he couldn't find them, he had to redo many of the papers because he lost them after I gave them back. My batchmates know how selfless I can be and do everything I can to help. Since I was already done with mine, he asked for my help. I stared and said, I already did, and went to the following table with my friends and did nothing. This guy honestly sounds like they're sinking themselves enough as it is. I mean, always being late, sulking around, they're kind of set to just doom themselves. Our next story is, former employers messed me around, I cost them money. Extremely petty, and probably didn't really cost them that much in the long run, but I felt satisfied doing it, so shrug. I worked for a government organization that spent the better part of last year messing us around about contracts. It's cancelled. No wait, we legally can't do that. Have an extra three months. Wait, no, we really need you guys and it's the week before your contracts are up, but could you maybe stay an extra three months and apply for permanent roles? Haha, <laughs> just kidding, you don't meet the criteria for the permanent position. So yeah, I was pissed and totally done with them. Well, it was a work from home position and they provided a bunch of equipment, which of course had to be returned. I literally live a five minute walk from the office, but I made them pay for a courier and pay to send me the labels. The first time around, the courier came before the labels did, so they had to rebook and send new labels, which happened over Christmas and coincided with a bunch of strikes, so I never got those labels. Third time was the charm. 
and I found out it cost them 50 British pounds for the courier to basically take it round the corner. Ultimately, it achieved nothing, but I got some satisfaction from messing them around like they did with me. Honestly, if I was working for somebody that jerked me around like that back and forth, I'd be chomping in the bit to find a way to stick it to them too. This next story is Revenge by Coconut. So, I live at one of my still best friend's place during university. During the time, he had pranked me by always setting our coffee machine to clean just at the time of day he knew I always took a cup of coffee. I didn't know that he did that, and he was laughing his rear off after one year of me complaining about it. It really drove me nuts. So, my revenge once I figured it out? He hates coconuts, and I mean really hates them. Hates the smell, the taste, even their look. He isn't allergic, he just hates them. So I started to hide coconuts everywhere, in sometimes obscure and weird places, sometimes in obvious places, and let me tell you something, coconuts are cheap. And my girlfriend at the time worked at a store and would always take home a lot of outdated coconuts to help me with my revenge. I hid them in his clothes, inside his computer, in the shower, under his bed, under his mattress, in the kitchen fan, in his bag, and so on. He knew it was me, but he didn't know it was also my girlfriend, which didn't live with us at the time. Of course, I denied it every time, and he really became paranoid when coconuts would just appear out of nowhere. When I and him were at the university, I'd given my key to my girlfriend, which promptly went home to us, and filled the entire fridge, the entire freezer, his entire wardrobe with coconuts. I can still hear his scream when I think about it. Not another freaking coconut. I freaking hate coconuts. For all he knew, she was out of town. And she gave my keys back to me at university when I took a WC break. He completely flipped out when we got home. He couldn't believe it. We only had two keys and went to the same classes. So he'd been with me the entire time. Except for the WC break. He asked to see my key, which of course I had at that point. He really became paranoid. He called the landlord and asked how many keys we had, and he said we only had two. He started from then, always searching for coconuts, and he always found one or two. He became pissed and went on with his day. He started complaining of how tedious it was to get rid of all the coconuts all the time. He even stopped suspecting me because I'd helped. Even after we moved out, we planted coconuts for years in his flat. He now actually believes he's cursed or something, because only he and his girlfriend live there now. Well, I actually recruited his girlfriend to be in to all of this. Once, he became so frustrated when he cleaned the kitchen and found two coconuts whilst alone, and had been alone for two weeks while his girlfriend was abroad. One behind the oven and one in a small, closed-off dodge behind the kitchen fan. You know, the space where there isn't any cabinets because of the kitchen fan tube. I'd actually planted it there one year prior when two workers did some maintenance and picked the kitchen fan apart and changed some things. You can't get to that space unless you literally pick the space apart. Apparently, he thought, darn, that place must be really dusty, I should clean it, and picked the place apart just to find another coconut. To this day, five years later, I still don't know if he's found all the coconuts I've hidden. Perhaps one day he'll find the coconut I stuffed in his bathroom ventilation. He's always complained it had a bad effect after I planted it. Well, I'll let you know if he does. I'm just wondering, like, coconuts go bad at some point, right? Like, shouldn't it become more and more obvious, like, especially by, like, the year-long point? Also, isn't it dangerous to put a coconut behind the oven? Our next story is, my neighbors pranked me and my roommates by stealing our furniture, so we let them keep the furniture. My next door neighbors thought it would be funny to steal all of our furniture out of our house. This was in college and we were friends with them, so it was all in good fun. There was no one home at the time, so they thought that they were so clever. I caught them when they took the last couch and my beanbag chair. I demanded my beanbag back, which I tackled someone for, but I wanted to go home and decompress from work. I didn't want to get all of our furniture back in the house, and it was also nighttime. The next day, my roommates and I were trying to figure out how to get back at them. We were impressed by how much effort they put in to grab the four couches, three coffee tables, dinner table and chairs, etc. We then realized their house was small, and it must have taken up all the open space. So we decided to not do anything about it. 
We go over there after two days, and they complain that they have to climb over the couches and tables to literally go anywhere in the house. There was no more walkable space in the house. They thought we couldn't wait them out, but they ended up yielding in the end. A prank's good and all, but they gave the power of the punchline to the people being pranked, and sometimes that can very clearly backfire. Our next story is, Coworker won't stop stealing? He'll learn the hard way. This was almost 30 years ago now, but my mom used to keep a bottle of liquid coffee creamer in the fridge at work because she hated the powdered stuff they provided for employees. Someone kept using it all and never replaced it. She even started putting a piece of masking tape on the bottle that said, Names creamer do not use, but of course that didn't deter them. She had recently delivered my sister and returned from maternity leave and was hormonal, exhausted, and stressed. So when she found her bottle of creamer in the fridge empty, she kind of lost it a bit and went off in the break room about whoever the inconsiderate jerk was that kept taking her stuff. Everybody relentlessly made fun of her for it. One guy even went as far as calling her the creamer runt behind her back. So the following week, she left her usual bottle of creamer in the same spot in the fridge, but this time with a note tape to the fridge door. Y'all can call me whatever names you want, but you should definitely stop taking my creamer. No later than 9.30 a.m. the same day, creamer runt guy was dry heaving into the break room sink. Oh my gosh, are you okay? Are you sick? My mom asks. I know you put spoiled creamer in there on purpose, you petty witch. My mom casually walks over to the fridge, pulls out the bottle of creamer with the masking tape on it, and shows it to him saying, well, if you'd bother to read the label, you'd know that it's not creamer. The storage bottle for my breast pump broke, so I had to find another container. Look, it's clearly marked names breast milk, not for coffee. See? It's right there. He was a known jerk around the office and was already on thin ice with management, so he knew better than to say anything. He never took anyone's stuff from the fridge after that, though. I mean, it's one thing to be a thief, a fridge thief at work. It's another to literally not read the note at all. You're really gambling with some confidence there. This next story is, you're suing me? Game on. I was looking for a Volkswagen bus to convert to a camper. I had test driven a few and thought I'd found the right one when I saw the advertisement VW bus, solid body, interior gutted, new brakes, new shocks, new steering, new tires, new engine. So I looked it over and test drove it. It looked super clean and solid and empty. So I paid the guy, let's call him Mr. Ski Bum, his asking price and drove it home. Upon arrival at home, the whole back end of the bus was covered with fresh engine oil. Something was seriously amiss. I took the bus to ye old reliable VW mechanic, a local guy who's been in business forever and has an impeccable reputation, and he told me, I sold this engine to Mr. Ski Bum a couple weeks ago. It came out of a junkyard bus. It runs well, but it really needs a rebuild. All the gaskets are shot. Looks like he just steam cleaned it and installed it in his bus. I asked him if he would put that in writing. He said he'd be happy to, since he knew Mr. Ski Bum was lying about the new engine. I was pondering my next move when I unexpectedly got a phone call from Mr. Ski Bum. He said, The bank won't cash your check because they can't read your wife's handwriting. I told him I'd be over first thing in the morning. I arrived at 7.30 a.m. with my bicycle in the back of the bus in case things didn't go well. Mr. Ski Bum was still in his pajamas. I took back the original check, and then I told him what I'd learned about his new engine, and that before I wrote another check, we'd have to renegotiate the price. He immediately got angry and shouted, You made a deal! I replied, You lied to me! No deal! And tossed him the keys. I grabbed my bicycle from the back of the bus and rode off into the sunset. I thought we were done until the next week when I received a letter from the law offices of Dewey, Cheatham, and Howe, representing Mr. Ski Bum. Mr. Ski Bum was suing me for breach of contract, despite having nothing in writing, including the check which I now had, and was also charging me the cost of having the bus cleaned and rental for the time, overnight, that I had it in my possession. So I headed over to the local police station with Ski Bum's advertisement for the bus, the statement from ye old reliable VW mechanic, and the letter from Dewey, Cheatham, and Howe. 
I asked them if the circumstances warranted a charge of false advertising. They assured me that it did and that they'd follow up on it and not to worry about Dewey, Cheatham and Howe because they'd been in business long enough to know better than to go forward with such a frivolous lawsuit. Judges do not like to have their time wasted. I had no further problems with Mr. Ski Bum. I suspect his legal fees amounted to more than his profit on that bus. Is there a good word for dumb confidence? This guy blatantly lied like so openly blatantly lied and tried to double down via lawsuit? I'm surprised that the law office went along with it that quickly without really researching the details. Our next story is, you mess with my twin, you mess with me. For context, my twin sister and I have disabilities. I have a mild form of cerebral palsy. My twin sister is wheelchair bound. She's very smart, she talks and is very outspoken. This happened when we were in high school, but this was the best revenge I did for my twin ever. My twin would have her physical therapy at school. Apparently, she had this new guy, let's call him Charlie. One day, my sister told my mom and she went to physical therapy. She told us Charlie put her on the physical therapy mat and made her do her own stretches as he sat down to read his newspaper. Mind you, my twin cannot walk or even move. My mom was instantly fuming, but I was livid. Luckily, I came up with a plan. My twin and I are big fans of Harry Potter. We had birdie bots every flavor beans. We got a ton for Christmas. So I came up with a plan to sort through every jelly bean. I sorted through the vomit, booger, grass, anything I considered nasty. I put each one of them in a big bag and told my twin to give this to Charlie when she sees him next. Don't worry. At this time, of course, my mom instantly contacted the school, but my plan was in motion. I told my twin that he's a jerk and this is what he deserves for doing that to her. She gave him the bag a few days later. My twin sister said she had a present and it was for him. She gave him the bag of jelly beans. Apparently, Charlie was so excited for the jelly beans. Apparently, he loved jelly beans. As for Charlie, I hope you enjoyed your vomit jelly beans on your unemployment. He was immediately fired. As for my twin, she obviously got a new therapist. We never had issues again. Best freaking revenge ever. Don't mess with my twin. I'd like to imagine that they were foolish enough to just keep trying all those jelly beans. Or maybe he had like a nice big handful all at once. But let's be real, he probably had one, two, realize they're all disgusting and tossed them. I'm glad he got fired though. This next story is, my foul smelling roommate threw a coupon book at me, so I moved out and froze the room. I've seen a number of bad roommate situations on the sub today, so I figured I'd add my story. I had a roommate that was loud all hours of the night. He would slam caffeine like his life depended on it and would scream at his video games until the sun rose. The stench of his unwashed body and unlaundered clothes stunk up the whole unit and hallway beyond it. You'd have thought something crawled into the ceiling and died. It is surprisingly difficult to put into words just how bad this man smelled. Imagine the scent of spoiled milk combined with a dead skunk. To make things worse, if I was away for the weekend, he'd invite over his drug-addicted friend who'd sleep in my bed and leave the covers undone. Despite all my attempts to communicate my displeasure, I knew there was no salvaging this crap storm of a living situation. At one point, he threw a coupon book in my head while I was sleeping. He claimed I was snoring and he didn't want to walk across the room to wake me up. I talked to the RA, this was a college dorm, and was able to move to a different dorm across the campus. Without telling my roommate, I moved out one evening while he was away at classes. I didn't tell him I was moving out. That man returned to his dorm room to find it devoid of everything except this foul odor, his messy stuff, and two windows glued open in negative 15 degrees Fahrenheit weather. Later, I found out from a former neighbor that he'd been confused by my disappearance and told everyone, we were such good roommates. I don't know why you left. Liar. This guy just sounds like the most complacent and oblivious type of person ever. They probably were completely unaware of how awful of a roommate they were being. This next story is the smallest of petty revenges, but talk about cathartic relief. So long story short, my sister has a jerk of a boyfriend. I cannot stand this moron. He buys stupid branded clothes and is snobby about buying anything cheap, but can't hold down a job. 
He puts everything on credit and is in serious debt with his bank. He's with the collections department and has been for some time. Yet he continues to buy 120 British pound shirts and stuff like that. He isn't funny or clever, he isn't good at small talk, doesn't have an ounce of banter. He's downright difficult to talk to. For reference, I've suffered with social anxiety and depression for over a decade. He's not like me. You're lucky if you get a, you alright, out of him. He can't seem to manage more than four or five syllables at once. His personality is so bland, it isn't even true. He doesn't have any discernible traits that would make him attractive. He has no manners. He's never thanked me once for cooking him dinner or bought round a bottle of wine. He drinks our alcohol when he comes around without asking and doesn't replace it. He's broken into our back garden when he's gotten too drunk. He's had the police called on him outside our house because he was shouting and punching himself in the face at 3 in the morning. He got barred from my sister's place of work for turning up drunk, banging on the windows and trying to fight the owner. But worst of all, he's very obviously been drunk and on other substances. We think mostly Coca-Cola around my nephew. I could write essays and novels about why this guy is a waste of oxygen, but please just trust me, if you're a relatively sane individual, you wouldn't like him. Have we tried to get my sister to dump him? Of course, but she is of course in love. So, my petty revenge, as small as it is, is based on these three things. He has a very short temper, sleeps very badly and is therefore usually up all night, and has a very bad credit history, which means he has a crappy mobile phone data plan and therefore relies on Wi-Fi. I control the Wi-Fi in my house. I've been blocking and unblocking him from our Wi-Fi every time he stays over for weeks now. I know he's awake and using the Wi-Fi because of an app I use. Very occasionally I'll block him all night long, but most of the time I'll do it on and off. If I wake up to pee at 2am, I'll block him and then unblock him when I get back to my room. If I can't sleep, I'll block him, unblock him, wait until he logs back on, wait 60 seconds and then block him again. I've done this repeatedly for probably 30 minutes straight at times. I've even set alarms for 4 or 5 a.m. to block him and go back to sleep because I know he wakes up early. I've heard him cursing from my sister's bedroom. I've heard him crashing about in the living room at half three in the morning, turning the router on and off. I don't know. This story is probably not thrilling for most people, but gosh darn does it feel good when I hit that block button. It's like a little gland in my brain releases a happy buzz. In all reality, OP probably does have a gland in their brain releasing a happy buzz. They probably legitimately get those dopamine hits when they hit that block button. And that's okay because this guy is a jerk. Our next story is Petty Revenge on the Workplace Sweet Stealer. For context, I live in Australia, so some of my terms and references may be a little different. I don't know if it's revenge or a prank, but I thought I would share. A few years back, I worked as a backstage technician at the local theater and convention center. It was a pretty cool place to work. I've met some awesome people. Our crew was pretty cool, made up of some pretty experienced guys. So when we were operating big gigs, someone would bring in some lollies or chocolates and it was unspoken that we could all partake and share on the proviso that you weren't greedy. However, if the head of audio was rostered on, to not leave anything lying around you don't want shared. He would just eat the lot and never contributed. At one point while working there, Cadbury Chocolate brought out a limited edition Vegemite chocolate block. I didn't try it. Even as an Aussie that loves Vegemite, that sounds gross. I thought it would be hilarious to buy a block and set it up for everyone to fall for. I opened it up and left it with the label face down. Keeping in mind it's a dark environment we work in, so really all you could see was it was just a block of chocolate. In walks the audio tech. Sorry, I should have also have mentioned that this guy is originally from overseas, which makes the idea of him eating Vegemite even funnier. Spies the chocolate and just helps himself to a few rows. I was super lucky to be there to watch him shove half in his mouth, gag and spit it out into the bin. The best $4 I ever spent. It didn't stop him, but he was much more careful after that. It definitely is a lot easier than finding out what they don't like and leaving that there. I guess also a problem with that is you would have to assume that there is something that they don't like. 
I mean, maybe this guy liked everything, even the Almond Joys. Our next story is, made the theater close. This happened 20 years ago and is still a point of pride. I had a second job at a movie theater when I first graduated college. Under the GM that hired me, it was actually a pretty cool gig. Then the company was sold and each GM after that got worse. I no longer needed the job and had turned in my notice. A snowstorm hit Saturday night into Sunday. I was scheduled as the projectionist for the day shift. I also rented where I had to shovel out my car plus the entire driveway. I got the call that we had a delayed opening when I'd taken a break from shoveling. I was pissed off that I had to go in for four hours. I realize now I could have told them to buzz off and gone back to bed. A couple of hours into my shift, I'd started the matinee movies only. The evening projectionist called because his street hadn't even been plowed. The lengths they went to to try to get me to stay were impressive. And if I hadn't already turned in my notice, I might have taken the money. The last offer they made me was double time for a double shift, including the initial two hours that were closed due to the storm. If I'd just started the 7 p.m. showing, and I just said the same thing I'd said the whole time they thought they were negotiating with me, that my shift was over at 6 p.m. and I was unavailable after that. We all got sent home early. The theater was closed for the day. My proudest day of my working life. Sure is nice to be able to call your employees on every little whim. Or, you know, cut their shifts in half on every little whim. God forbid they don't act like brainless zombies and just comply. Our next story is, hound me out of a job? Enjoy non-stop phone ringing. About 18 years ago, I worked in an outpatient medical clinic at the front desk. There was a lot of turnover with that job, primarily due to the other front desk person and her two pals, the nurse and the medical assistant. I caught wind of the fact that they'd bullied my two predecessors into quitting before six months had passed and was told to be on my guard. It was solid advice. The three of them, especially my colleague at the front desk, started in on me too. I was accused of other people's errors, I was blamed for things not being done that were someone else's responsibility, and they were just plain nasty human beings. I would come in every morning to find that my adjustable height desk chair was pushed all the way down to the lowest possible height, so I would have to adjust it to my own height every freaking morning. There's more, but I'll spare you the details. Just presume daily low-key and high-key harassment. The way this clinic was set up, we were both checking patients in and out, and we were answering phones and forwarding them as needed. There was also one cordless phone located behind the desk, specifically for patients to use if they needed to call a cab or make some other call. Mobile phones were just starting to really take off in the early 2000s and not everyone had one yet, especially not the older patients. We couldn't have patients using the front desk phones to make calls because we had to keep those lines clear for incoming calls from patients and doctors. Hence, the solution was this cordless phone. We were instructed to never answer incoming calls to that phone, as it was not one of our official phone lines. The problem was that some of the recipients of patients' calls would then try to call that number when they wanted to reach the patient, as that's what they had on their caller ID. So while the phone didn't ring daily, there were some days when that cordless phone would ring off the hook due to some really really persistent person who kept trying and we couldn't answer it no matter how long they let it ring. After a few months, I had had enough. No one before my arrival had ever successfully figured out how to turn the ringer off that phone, but I picked up the thing and dug, dug, and dug some more through the menus. Finally, after about three or four menu levels deep into the settings, I found the volume setting and set it to zero. Again, early 2000s tech, which was far less user-friendly than what we have now. Peace and quiet at last. Well, the bullying continued. Unlike my two predecessors, I actually lasted a year in that job, but even I can only tolerate so much torment. The stress was starting to cause medical issues, so I knew I had to go. Shortly before my last day on that job, Late in the afternoon, when I was the last one left in the office, I dug through the multiple menu levels on that phone again and turned the ringer volume up to the maximum. 
Unfortunately, I forgot to call myself with that phone to get the number on my caller ID, so I wasn't able to call it and let it ring ad infinium myself, but I know from experience that there were people who would call repeatedly and let it ring for a year, rather than hang up after a reasonable amount of time. And I'm equally sure that no one else figured out how to turn the ringer back off, because if they'd been able to do that, it would have already have been turned off long before I got the job. So for the next few years, at least until the building closed and they moved to their new location, I hope that phone rang off the hook for them on a regular basis. Petty? Sure. But nowhere near what they deserved for being bullying jerks. Bullies can go kick rocks. I'm just sad that OP wasn't like reporting them to some form of corporate. I mean, considering this is like a medical clinic, they have to have some kind of corporate, right? Maybe an HR? These people and their bullying deserve to be reported. Was it like nepotism? Like how did these people survive being so awful? But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. Now, if you want to hear another absolutely awesome story of revenge, check out that video on the left. Or if you missed my latest video, check out that video on the right. That said, I'll see you all next time with some more stories 